Hey, all right. Yep. It's just me and Granthers in a chat. Oh, uh, it's so lonely in here. Yeah, it's all right. We just keep. Got to do the show, man. Got to do the show. Well, that's oh, what I'm no, saying. Oh, now they're all showing up now. That fucking Tammy shows up. <laughs> and Tammy wants to show up. Well, I guess everybody knows it's like yeah. that we do like the little five minute uh, right. kind of run up to it. So they're yeah. just kind of like, well, I don't want to sit around for that. I don't. I don't blame them. Maybe we should kind of quit doing that. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe just do it like a minute or something. Yeah, they're all they're all they're all fucking uh, pouring in now. Four draw downs in. Okay, this movie here. <laughs> Tom's Bear, just getting right into get it. Get right down to this shit here. <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop three. Three. This movie here. Okay. This is not a bad movie, but it's also not great. Okay, they really fucked this one up, but this movie could easily be fixed. It's really only got a couple problems with it. The main problem is just tone. It does not have the same tone as the other two. Uh, it's got no soundtrack to speak of and a shitty classical fucking score that kind of apes the fucking um, uh, uh, fucking Beverly the Hills Cop one and two theme songs, you know, like the Axel Foley theme song. It's just, man, it's just not, this movie just was not made with care when it came to the sound, the, the score and the soundtrack. I don't know if they got fucked over on licensing agreements and shit. Well, with the other I ones. think that, yeah, I think what happened was that Harold Faltermeyer, who did yeah. Axel F, like the main theme in the score for the yeah. first one and the second one too, I think. Um, I think he did not want to return uh, okay. So they did actually use the Axel F theme in the third one, but it was like a cover version, cover which version, I think yeah. Niall Rogers had done. Yeah. Um, so they did like a bunch of different versions of it, including like a weird theme Classical. parky version. Yeah, yeah. They did that. They did so they did like some variations on it just because yeah. they couldn't get uh, Harold Faltermeyer back to do the original right. score. Other than that, there is some really good things about this movie. It's got a really cool fucking stunt scene. It kind of took me out of it a little bit with fucking Eddie Murphy saving some kids on a damn big old fucking that spider, spider ride. ride. Yeah. Which uh, in the other two movies, there's never a hint of fucking that Axel Foley had had that level of dexterity. I mean, shit, that a terrified fucking paratrooper or a special forces soldier fucking jumping from one fucking thing to the next. That yeah, was straight like, up. No, thank you. Yeah, Screw was, you, kids. Yeah. That, <laughs> I'm not jumping from the one to the other. Yeah, no and, that, and that fucking stunt looked real. Looked like that dude really did that. It did. Um, honestly, yeah. I mean, obviously, like, Eddie Murphy's part was, like, green screened in, which you could yeah. kind of, it didn't look that bad, but you could still tell. Um, but yeah, the way that, like, the long shots of that stunt looked like the actual stuntman was, like, actually jumping from... Yeah. thing to think and I, I don't know if he had some kind of like say i mean i'm sure they had some kind of like fucking net or mattress or some kind of shit underneath they would have been a net, in case he mattress. fell yeah well you know well you know i didn't mean mattress but i yeah. mean like a big like yeah. a pad you know big, what i mean yeah. like they have the big air the big air thing. yeah that big, big air, air cushion thing. Yeah. yeah but you, you couldn't see it it wasn't in the shot well yeah that's kind of like movie magic you yeah. know yeah there probably been easier to hide a uh, a uh a net but uh, anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Well, now the, we're still talking about the movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it does take place in some pretty fucking um, weird locations inside of a theme park. Uh, the opening, the opening scene of a fucking SWAT team thing that they were gonna do. They were gonna make this bust in the very beginning, and they didn't call SWAT because it was just mechanics. They thought they could handle it, but when they showed up, they were getting whacked by the mob basically, and they got in a big fucking crossfire not with really the mob but the bad guys out of this movie um that was a pretty cool scene it kind of felt like the older movies it had a good good car chase in it so some of the stunts and some of the action and the firefights actually were kind of ramped up over the other two it was more but it it didn't seem like more and it was because of the fucking score and the soundscape wasn't that good um the a lot of it took place in the amusement park and it has goofy fucking amusement park songs happening in the middle of firefights it just doesn't it doesn't fit the movie it doesn't fit the tone of the movie it'd have been better had they just put an uh, axel foley theme song or better stuff i know they're trying to they were trying to update the movie to because this is 94 
It was quite yeah, late. Yeah, I didn't realize that it was that much later and then yeah, the second one. Quite late. So the other two had pretty contemporary music in it for the times that they came out. Real hip shit. So what would have been hip in 94? Fuck. What? What, Cold Grunge? <laughs> yeah. Nirvana? <laughs> fucking, uh... Some Soundgarden in there. Yeah, Soundgarden for Alice in Chains. <laughs> uh, it would have been shit like that. Yeah, what was going on in 1994? So, you know, but fucking... I'm too sexy for my shirt? What, <laughs> what, what year did that come out? I mean, 91, 92, maybe? Ooh, I'm too sexy. What yeah. year did that came out? That, I kind of feel like that was maybe 1991? Yeah, that would have been something that that, that, that would have been in an, in an Axel Foley movie. Real poppy, big hit. Well, I, George Michael's I Want Your Sex was in the second one, which was yeah, 87. That's right. that's right. In the strip club scene. That's right. Which I think w- went a long way toward like pushing that into the charts, you know? What I yeah. Mean? Like it yeah. being in that movie. I could think I forgot to mention that. Like on. That. I think there was something about licensing, though. They didn't want to fucking yeah, cause give I, money away. I, I feel like this one, I mean, obviously the budget for this one was way lower because, like I said, Beverly Hills Cop 2 came out in 1987. This one didn't come out until 1994. And the movie that Eddie Murphy had done prior to this sort of tanked or it didn't do as well as the as the studio was expecting so the budget for this one got knocked down so they're yeah. still gonna make it but they didn't yeah. have as much money as they thought they were gonna have right so i kind of feel like yeah it doesn't have any iconic music um it still has the axel f theme but it's like covers and like variations on it instead yeah. of the actual one and you know no pointer sister songs no like catchy pop songs nothing like that and I was actually shocked. I didn't realize this. I didn't realize that John Landis directed this. Now, John Landis, obviously, he did uh, he did Trading Places and he yeah. did uh, Coming to America. So Should he had worked great. with Eddie Murphy before. That's what I mean. And the thing about it, though, was that John Landis, like, um, you know, they asked him to direct this and he didn't like the script at first. But he was just kind of like, well, I read the script and I thought, eh, it's, the script isn't that good. But we'll get Eddie Murphy in here and he'll be funny. He'll improv. And yeah. it'll fix it. Yeah. So that's what he thought. But Eddie Murphy didn't do do that really. He nah. seemed like he wasn't as funny in this one. Um, he had his moments, but I was kind of reading like on the Wikipedia page they said they they had done like an interview with um, Bronson Pinchot who plays Serge, yeah. who's in this, and he said um, I kind of feel like Eddie Murphy feel like uh, his last few movies hadn't done that well, and he seemed kind of like low energy and like yeah. depressed. Um, and I think that kind of came across in his performance uh, as well. And another thing, too, is that when John Landis was, like, talking to him about, okay, now we're going to do, like, the fast-talking Axel Foley shit that everybody loves and, like, tunes mm. into this movie for, he kind of came, Eddie Murphy kind of said, oh, well, this is this many years later, and I think Alex Foley, uh, uh, Axel Foley would have, like, grown up by now and been more mature, so he's not going to mm. do that as much. Mm. So I kind of feel like he played it, like, too straight, and that wasn't really... I mean, he there were like some he did like some funny fast talking shit like he did in the old ones, but not really that much. Most of it he was just playing straight or like not yeah. really telling any jokes or anything. Yeah, I was looking at this. Okay, what was it? What was it? the dude who played Serge? His per- Bencho, yeah. yeah, his performance isn't really spot on either. Uh, when he did the high pitch stuff, you can tell that it. You know what it is? It did not have that high energy cocaine fueled nature. That's what I'm saying. Of the other two it movies. seemed a little I think they were jacked on Coke. Probably. The, they were having a great time and it was just And a lot of it was improvisational. Was improv, right. This one really seemed more little... scripted and like yeah. they weren't it didn't seem yeah. as natural or organic. It, well, part of it, you know, when you're young and you're maybe new into a project, you know, fucking you got you do have more energy. You feel on top of the world. It could be they were slightly war, world weary, like he said. They were getting beaten down from not having great movies back to back a couple. Well, times. yeah, I think. But and you can't get hung up on that. You got to fucking snap out of it and make a fucking comeback. But you know, stress and fucking worrying about it can pile on. You know, so I I know what he's coming from. I can detect that. Now that you said that, he says, yeah, that, that's that, that's what's coming through. That is absolutely that's how he comes through. across in this movie. Yeah. Because there are a couple of scenes where he's still doing that, right. his Eddie Murphy thing. But most of it is just, he's just playing right. like pretty well, straight, like a straight cop that's now, just... I was going to go back to Serge's, his performance, not only was his performance not really top notch compared to you know his other appearance, 
the edit isn't quite right. There's too much of him. A lot of his yeah. shit needs to be edited down into quick sound bites that were funny. And uh, it, the, the, that scene kind of dilly dallied a little too much. And it kind of took the funniness away because... It went on too long. It went on too long. The thing about Surge, what made him funny is that he there was an element of mystery to Surge. You don't yeah. know much about him. He's just this strange gay dude in a fucking... Well, not only really strange. He is strange, you know, uh, but he's snotty. A snotty gay dude in an uh, art gallery who's trying to be friendly to you. He's trying to be friendly. He's trying to offer you stuff. But he, in a way, is kind of looking down on you a little bit. And that's how he came across to me, you know, the fancy art guy. Um, and you don't... That's what made that character great. You don't know a whole lot about him. So they leave you kind of wondering, who is that dude? You know? Yeah. That's what made him interesting, you know? And in this one, they kind of give you a little too much of him. Although it's not bad. It just needed to be... It, it, it needed to be about half that length. Yeah. And I've, compressed. I think the problem, too, was that in the first one, I think what's so... Fun, like, Bronson Pinchot was really funny in that. Yeah. But I think a lot of the funny, too, came from him his interaction or his reactions yeah. to Eddie Murphy. And in this one, it seemed like I, you know, I always want more of Surge cause I love that character, but they, he kind of goes on for a long time and Eddie Murphy doesn't really react to him. He's yeah. just like standing there going, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like he's not, there's no like back and forth. What's the fish out of water angle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Axel's a detective and he's very, he's Detroit, which is opposite from, from, from fucking Beverly Hills. It's the opposite. And this guy's from the art scene? Oh, man, no, that's fucking totally opposite. So they don't really, on the surface, have anything in common. And and that's what made that scene funny. Yeah. Um, now, in this one, there's more interaction. They kind of become friends. But like I said, the scene is a little bit too long. It, it didn't have the punchy nature of your first encounter with fucking Surge. Yeah. It was, you know what I'm talking about? It had that very punchy nature and it happened fast. Every time you saw him, it was just over with and he didn't have many lines and, and it actually it kind of, but his delivery was so good you remembered it. That character was super memorable. Yeah. Super memorable. Which is why, like, I appreciated that they brought him back for the third one. Yeah. I just think that, you know, and I even, I you know, even though it's not super believable, but they bring it back in the third one, like he's at this, like, cop uh, he said a, he said a what weapon, is it like a it's like, like a, a weapons gun show. like a gun show it's, it's, it's type probably, of thing but like a high end one yeah it's uh, it's 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 an arms supplier for, and he's for, open like a boutique yeah and a boutique with like fa with like fans like weapons that are but are like really stylish and fancy it was uh, what they call boutique urban survival right high end urban yeah. survival so it was urban survival shit for rich people and he was going and he goes who would buy this shit. It was this fucking gun that had a CD player and a microwave and fucking all Yeah, what was that called? It had all this shit. I forgot, man. The Annihilator or, the Annihilator or 2000 or something, or something like, like that. Who would buy this? And he goes, fucking Jackie Stallone. It had a microwave in it. Had a microwave it had a microwave oven it had a microwave in it. It had a microwave oven on it, too. It was good. You could survive. And it, you, know, you could survive. <laughs> the microwave is like this. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, that, said, that bit was funny. Like, the fake commercial for that yeah. was actually pretty funny. He said, she goes, oh, Jackie Stallone bought uh, four or five of them for stocking stuffers. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone bought, what, what is it, about ten of them? Something, you know, he says, yeah, oh, they sell. Like I can't keep them in stock. And he's like, really? And then the gun makes an appearance later on. He needs a weapon. Serge gives him that. A floor model. And he goes, yeah, but it's all dirty. It's all smelly. And he hasn't cleaned it up and shit. Give it to him. And he goes to fight the bad guys with that thing. And doesn't know how to use it. He plays music and shit. <laughs> Which is kind of funny, but... The soundtrack and the fucking score doesn't match what's happening with the comedy. It doesn't enhance it. A lot of these, yeah. fucking, a lot of these um, uh, ad libbed, ad libbed fucking things that 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 Eddie Murphy does in this movie is to like with no music or no soundtrack at all, dead. And the the edit is a little bit too long, which kind of sucks the humor out of it. It didn't have the punchy nature of the first two movies. It just, and it could be saved in edit. This movie could really be saved. I'd edit a lot of it down and make it a lot tighter and put a really good score with a lot of fucking cool music in it. A lot of cool songs from the time. And then some classic ones. Yeah, I mean, I think there's enough good stuff in this that, yeah, it could probably be salvaged. Yeah, but it's edit. 
edit and music. But basically. honestly, I think a lot of this more like kind of more serious shit with Eddie Murphy's character could probably just be like either cut out. I mean, obviously you can't reshoot it, but I don't know if they did any different shit. It just seemed like he wasn't doing all the improv like he was doing on the old ones. And so there wasn't enough of that of that Axel Foley character yeah. in there because so much of it was just kind of like a straight detective story. It wasn't, yeah. you know, it wasn't quite as funny. Like the interaction with him and Judge Reinhold uh, wasn't quite as funny. And it's just kind of like, and John Ashton wasn't even in it, um, you know, Taggart. Yeah. And the, all they said was that, oh, he retired. Yeah. And uh, they didn't even say what happened to, to uh, Bogomil. Bogomil. He must have died. Um, no, well, he didn't want to do the movie. Yeah. Like, so he okay. read the script and said, mm, no, thanks. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Uh, so, but they don't even mention him in right. the, in the movie. They mentioned Taggart. They said that right. he retired, but they didn't mention, uh, Bogomel, like what happened to him. So I thought that was a little weird. I think what you were saying about some of the seriousness that could have worked too, if you'd had the right music and the right score, because you could have made it real serious, and deep and dark just for a few minutes and then lighten it back up again with something else. Like it doesn't have... It was weird, the tone, it was just totally all over the place. Trying to be funny when it wasn't really that funny at certain times, and then trying to be serious, but they'd have goofy music going. It, the yeah. tone was a little... It could be, this movie could be fixed, though. Because I mean... A little bit of tighter edit and better score. I mean, if you haven't seen it, again, you know, it's... Because I kind of feel like by the third time, it's just like, you know, how is this Detroit cop? How are we going to get him to Beverly Hills? It just seems yeah. like it's kind of straining credulity at this yeah. point. But so what happens at the beginning? Like I said, in the, the opening sequence is actually pretty good um, where, you know, uh, Eddie Murphy and his team are like kind of uh, they're trying to like bust uh, Chop Chop. And they think that it's just going to be like an easy bust. They don't call SWAT. Shit goes super sideways because there's this other bigger crime conglomerate that's attached to it that they didn't know about. And uh, upshot of it is pretty much um, his boss, uh, Todd, gets killed. So uh, he's going to find the person that killed Todd. And it ends up that, you know, they are having to do with this theme park in Beverly Hills called Wonder World which is essentially kind of like Disney. They kind of have like an old like Uncle Dave. He's kind of like the guy behind it. And they have all these rides. They actually have um, some of those rides. Because remember I said when we were watching it, like that one ride where everybody was like shaking and there's like the, uh, you know, the, th the road like crashing down in there with the truck and everything. I said, that looks like the earthquake ride that used to be at uh, Universal or MGM or whatever. Because I remember riding that like in Orlando like years ago. And when I looked it up on Wikipedia, yeah, they did actually shoot the stuff inside of the um, inside of the earthquake ride at Universal uh, in California. Some of the other stuff, like the dinosaur ride at the end, um, they built that like on a sound stage. And some of the stuff they shot like in a they asked Knott's Berry Farm, but Knott's Berry Farm said no, absolutely not. You're not shooting it here. So some of the stuff they built, and some of the stuff was like some other like lesser known theme park, I guess, that they shot in. But yeah, so he ends up going and finding out that like this theme park is essentially like the, isn't it like the security guards that that work there are like a private security company and they're using the theme park as like a front and then they're counterfeiting? Yeah. So it's like a counterfeiting. Because they have a laser printer. Right. It's like a counterfeiting. <laughs> I know. Which <laughs> okay. It's like a the counterfeiting. High tech, 94, yeah. And uh, so they are kind of like, yeah. they have like a little like counterfeiting shop like underneath this closed ride. Yeah. And it's like all super top secret and everything. And most of the people that are like involved in the security company um, know about it. So it's yeah. just like this big ring. And so uh, Axel Foley is like trying to, he kind of stumbles into that because the guy that end up that killed Todd, he recognized him and he yeah. was like one of the main guys from the security company. Yeah, the bad guys are basically uh, you know, unremarkable. They just yeah. they just don't stand out at all. Another thing about the movie that we kind of missed. I think like I said, this movie's a miss. It's not a disaster though. If you if you liked the first two, it's worth seeing. It's just okay. It's not great. It's not terrible. It's just okay. It's some extra stuff. It looks like it feels like it was the the tone is wrong. It was kind of like it was cobbled together to make some money. That's that's what it felt like. Um, but there is some good shit in it. You know, it has its moments. 
yeah, the I movie mean, could be fixed. I didn't mind some of the stuff. Like yeah. some of the shit was funny. Uh, I liked uh, Hector Elizondo's character, who yeah. is basically the Taggart stand-in. Yeah, uh, he was funny. But even like Judge Reinhold, I ju- I generally I I didn't realize how much I missed the Taggart character until he wasn't there. Yeah, like as good as Hector Elizondo is in it, um, I kind of liked the trio, you know, of yeah. Eddie Murphy and Judge Reinhold and John Ashton. They played off each other so well because they were all three of them were so different. And uh, once you don't have that, it's just kind of like. I don't know. There was just like something missing, and even Judge Reinhold seemed like he wasn't in it all that much. Yeah. And he wasn't. Um, I don't know. He just was didn't seem as funny. Like I said, the interactions just weren't as funny. They weren't as natural or as organic. And yeah. some of the shit, like I said, like the stuff with Surge, and like I'm not shitting on the Surge character because I love Surge, but um, it just it needed to be like tightened up. Yeah. It's and almost... there needed to be more interaction between Surge and Eddie Murphy rather yeah. than Eddie Murphy just standing there listening to Surge talking. talking. To him, right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They need to do something. Yeah. They need to like bounce off do one another because yeah. that's what was funny about the first right, one yeah. is they were like reacting to one another yeah. and they weren't really doing that in this. Yeah. He was just like Surge was basically just like giving a sales pitch of like right. his stuff, which like I said was funny, but. You know, then they better. then they'd cut to Eddie Murphy and he'd be like, "Oh yeah, cool." You know what I mean? There, yeah. It's a there wasn't really any kind of like. I'm gonna stick with my original statement though. This movie, if you were to re-edit this movie and put a good soundtrack in it, a really good score, this movie would be twice as good as it is. I mean, it's not fatally flawed. The main problem is the edit and the soundscape. It, yeah, they improved it a lot. Would it be as good as the other two? No, no, no. Uh, I would have done it differently. I wouldn't have brought him back to Beverly Hills. I would have had Axel get in trouble there in Detroit, and then had I would have had something like I would have had uh, Rosewood um, come from Beverly Hills to help. Yeah, Axel see, that would have been kind of cool if you set one in Detroit. So you now got the Beverly Hills cop, and that one would be to. Uh, uh, Rosewood. Rosewood would be the would be the Beverly Hills cop. I guess See, that would have been a good switcheroo Switch. because then you would have had like a Beverly Hills cop coming to Detroit, and it would have been again you would right. have had the fish out of water element, but opposite. Right. They should have been listening to me, but I was, you know, <laughs> and I've done it that way, and then um, that way you could try to get some licensed Bob Seger bullshit or whatever, or some Detroit fucking music or something. Yeah, I don't know, you know. <laughs> 94, uh, uh, they probably felt, look, we shouldn't go retro because, you know what I mean? Like, and that wasn't that long ago. So yeah, you, you really can't do this... retro until it's like until a while. It's way, oh, way yeah. old. <laughs> but uh, you could have made a real good 90s soundtrack in Detroit. Late, mid-90s, 94, man. You'd have, you could have done some really cool goth-type shit. Uh, a couple goth-type songs, like something out of The Crow. Because there's a goth scene going on there. You could do rap. Uh, they were, you could do um, house music. They did a lot of that in Detroit during that time. I mean, I kind of feel like some of the ones... Because it was done. Nile Rodgers, I feel like a lot of it was kind of like R&B, which is fine. Yeah. But, you know, Nile Rodgers, he did shit with fucking everybody. He worked at Duran Duran, too, like back yeah. in the 80s. But um, I don't know. I just kind of feel like... I don't think grunge would have worked. I don't think... Honestly, I think that it would have been better kind of going with the first couple movies if they'd have just done, like pop music like the yeah. pop music that was From on the time. which i can't even remember what was popular in 1994 it would have been grunge but i don't see i don't know that no because yeah. there was still pop techno. music there was there still was pop techno, music in 1994 techno maybe they should have done yeah. that or techno. i don't know i don't really know how it would have worked but i it's just, it's kind of hard for me to say because i mean i didn't hate this movie i just i thought it was just like kind of low energy yeah yeah, yeah. But you could have had so much fun shooting this in Detroit. With all those damn abandoned yeah, buildings see, and everything. Been, maybe you, they'll do that for the fourth could, one. Yeah, you could have some badass fucking bad guys centered around Detroit, kind of like they did with the Crow. Um, and you could fucking you could actually burn down and blow up houses because they had fucking abandoned shit everywhere. And then you could bring the. There was fucking all kinds of cool shit. Uh, the, 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 the abandoned subways in Detroit, abandoned skyscrapers. They could have had a lot of fun down there. It wouldn't cost them that much to make that there. And uh, I would have put it to Detroit. Made it a Detroit movie. Yeah, I think that would have been probably best. Yeah. Because... Showing Axel in his element. 
Yeah, because then that way, and then you don't have the problem of, like I said, straining credulity, being like, oh, really? Is this dude He's having back? to go out to Beverly Hills again, yeah, like, yeah. for the third time? It's like, no one's going to believe that. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, why are all these people from Beverly Hills coming right. to Detroit and fucking shit up? Because what's funny is that every scene in this movie that was shot in the Detroit felt a lot more like Beverly Hills Cop, didn't it? It did, yeah. Because on, honestly, like I kind of liked the opening scene. Could have done without the weird... Um, the weird, like, uh, dancing scene, like, with the two criminals yeah, at the dumb, beginning. Dumb. Like, it wasn't super long. It wasn't the whole song or anything. It like, two seconds. What song? What, uh, that was the Supremes, it's right? It's the Supreme song, yeah. Yeah. That should have been one or two seconds long. Yeah, that, let them know again, that like, it. it just, everything went on, like, a little bit too, too long. long. Like, yeah. stuff that was, be, that was supposed to be funny, but it just yeah. went on, like, too long for it to be funny. Yeah. If that had been, like, one second or a two second seconds. where yeah. they both turned around at the same time and did, like, a dance move. And then they cut away. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been hilarious. It would have been a lot more funny. But don't do it for like a minute. Right. Because I was just like, why are we having a dance for an hour? What is this all about? But why the, would you do that? <laughs> but the scenes that took place in Detroit, the tonally felt a lot more like the, the other first two movies. It, it was when it went back to Wally World or wherever that fucking place was. Wonder World. Wonder World. It fucked it up. I would have shot that shit in Detroit and made that a fucking hardcore Blade Runner-esque type fucking movie. I must say I did like the scene where uh, where Eddie Murphy was in the okie-dokie elephant suit yeah. and like pushed that little kid into the fountain. Like that was funny. Yeah. But honestly, that scene should have gone, that scene was like super, super short, but it should have gone on a little bit longer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where he like punched the kid or something. That yeah. would have been hysterical. <laughs> Yeah. Then, like, have the grandma come over there and be like, you deserved it, or whatever. But it's like, yeah, it just seemed like the jokes that were not all that funny went on too long, and the jokes were actually funny weren't long enough, or there wasn't enough of them. It was just, I don't know, it was just a very, very strange experience. I thought that maybe I had seen it back in the day, but nothing seemed familiar. The only thing that was familiar to me from this movie was from the beginning where he knocks on the door of the warehouse and says, is this the illegal chop shop? And I'm thinking maybe I remember that just because it was from the trailer. Yeah. Uh, because that was literally the only thing. Yeah. I didn't remember anything about a theme park or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, Could have also done without the love interest. Mm. Um, because you didn't have that in the other two, really. Yeah. And, um, you know, I could have done without it in this one. It, it was just kind of like underdeveloped and it just didn't really need to be in there. You Great. know, the, that woman that, uh, that worked in the theme park, you know. Yeah. Graham's asked me about Blackwater. I got offers from them, man, back in fucking uh, 95, back before I even knew what that was. And that shit sounded so sideways and so shady, and they wouldn't answer any questions. I fucking turned it down. I had no idea what that was in 95. And then by the time we knew, then it was, all, it was already stuff. I worked for companies that trained foreign police and foreign soldiers. But like I said, the... These are contracts that go through the State Department a lot of times for companies that only exist for that mission and they shut down and then it'll form again or another one will form again under another name. The Blackwater's mistake was is that you know its name. All right. What that used to be, or Blackwater is now a bunch of other companies that are constantly opening and closing, opening and closing. That's part of its camouflage. You'll, so it would take me a while, but I could find it. But I wouldn't want to get involved in that, man. I'm too old for that bullshit. And then look what they'd have you do. You know? And then Wagner Group. You know, some people call him Wagner. But Wagner, I would never work for Wagner. All right. Fucking half the dudes in that fucking group right there. The <laughs> They're Ukrainian and, Ukrainian and Russian dudes with SS runes and fucking death's heads on them. Fucking Nazi death's heads. It's a lot of shit people don't realize of what they're like, you know, in that part of the world. I wouldn't deal with them. Slasher Fred points out that this movie also starred John Saxon. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. He's yeah, actually one, right. of the, one of the bad guys. Yeah. And uh, I want to say, too, because John Landis directed it, and uh, John Landis is kind of well-known for putting his friends or, like, other directors as cameos. Uh, so Joe Dante turns up in this, as does John Singleton. 
Uh, and Ray Harryhausen was in there too, of all yeah. the fucking people. I think he was in that bar scene. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Gramther says, have Rosewood working the streets of Detroit as ghetto dogs carry limbs down the street of dead drug addicts they found in abandoned homes. Yeah. They could go to one of the strip, bar, strip bars along Eight Mile Road. A stripper could snort blow off Rosewood's schlong in the broom closet as Axel watch. Yeah. See, that's a movie that yeah. I would watch. See, gra- grabs the X. I would watch. You're, you were Detroit PD. I don't remember where it was. I think I think you said you were Detroit. But uh, we, now we, I'm we kind of curious to, because, as far as I know, they're still making the fourth one, right? I um, mean, they've been talking about that since 2015. It's well, I rumored mean, that that's the next one. Well, last I heard. I don't know if this is still the case, but like in 2019 or 2020, they were talking about uh, that the fourth one was going into pre-production after coming to America, the second one. Okay. So I don't actually know if they're going to make it or not. But honestly, if they did, okay. I think they should do like the switcheroo thing. Oh, okay. Because like where they go to Detroit. I mean, I think that would be better. Yeah, okay. If they could get everybody back again. I know probably everybody's old as shit now, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. Grunther said no. I was a federal agent oh, in okay. Detroit. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I think he said that yesterday yeah. actually. But yeah. So, so I don't know. It's just kind of like there was just something very odd about this movie, and it's really that's why I was like so shocked that John Landis had directed it because him and Eddie Murphy had worked t- together a lot before, um you know on some great fucking movies, and so it just seemed like this one. I don't know. Like I said, I think some of it is attributable to the direction, the editing mostly, but I think a lot of it is attributed to like Eddie Murphy just not seeming like he was that super into it. Like he's just really not, he seems kind of like bummed out. It seems kind of, and even like at the time, like the reviewers were like, this is a very depressing film. It's very joyless. It doesn't have like a lot of the energy that like the other ones had. And he just seems like he's, playing the character mostly straight, which is not really what you want to see from this character. So I kind of felt that, like, through the whole thing. Like I said, there's some good shit in it, but I don't know. It was just something. And there was, like, some good stunts, like the whole stunt, like, on the spider ride and everything like that. That was, like, a good sequence. Although it went on a little bit too long, like a lot of the sequences did in this. But, I mean, it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't... I don't know. There was just something, like, really... I, I think that the time for that had passed by that point. You know what I mean? Because it was so much later, like after the second one. And I just kind of feel like they had missed the window of opportunity and everyone was just kind of like sick of it at that point. And they were just kind of like, bah, fuck it. And it's just, you know. But what are you going to do? It's it's not as bad as everyone says. Although I will say that on Rotten Tomatoes, I noticed it has 9%, which is pretty bad. Pretty bad. It's not that bad. It's not yet. Yeah. Well, not I, you know, like I said, I was, you know, I'm a big mystery science theater fan, so I've seen like, oh yeah, I probably, I, I could think of a hundred movies right now that yeah. are like way worse than this one, but um, you know, it just wasn't, it didn't have that magic. The other two I mean? are eights and nines. This one's more like a six, four, five. Yeah, somewhere which is, around there. And I think, I think the reaction is, is the disappointment from the fans. Yeah, that's, why, that's mostly what. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think they waited too long. Yeah. Um, they made the character too mature, you know, it didn't have that same zing, it didn't have a lot of the character interaction that made the other ones so good, like a lot of the improvisational stuff, and it's just, you know, so it just kind of, it felt a little, like, flat and a little lifeless, you know what I mean? It looked okay, like, it, like, it, it was shot fine and everything like that, but... It's edit and soundscape. Yeah. I think, honestly, the editing and yeah. the, and the kind of, like, tone of it just being like a little bit too serious it's yeah. like it's weird because it's almost like too serious but then too goofy like it needed a yeah. better balance there's like really really goofy shit and then most and then it's like really serious and it just doesn't really work all that well you know yeah but uh oh we're going red red oh, okay. how no it came back it came back yeah. okay it was just a second yeah that must have just been our the whole house like yeah fucking thing but yeah it came back uh so yeah are we done talking about beverly hills cop three yeah. We sounded real enthused about this. <laughs> it's not that yeah. bad. It's not terrible. It wasn't as bad as I was expecting, but it was, yeah, it was a little bit of a, a trial to sit through, gotta say. A little bit, because it just... Yeah, yeah Gramps, the guys, the guys who had the EOD credentials did all the classroom work stuff. Most of your dudes that kind of had infantry-type experience did all the fucking range and field stuff. You know, running the ranges, 
blowing shit up, picking up stuff, teaching how to fucking pick things up, making grids in the ground, all the fucking hands-on shit. But then the dudes with the EOD fucking credentials, you know, they're kind of like our versions of commissioned officers. They were the ones that were fucking making all the money. <laughs> but that's how it always is. We well, do the work, they do all the money. They get all the money. Look at that shit. Ooh, my creepy phone's ringing again. Yeah. Telemarketers. But uh, it probably says spam risk. That shit is always fucking spooky, though, because you teach one thing, but then it can be reversed into something else. And then shit happens, and you go, what, was that the intent? So you get real suspicious. State Department shit. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm getting kind of hungry. It's, it's, okay, yeah, yeah, It's yeah. about dinner time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All I've eaten today is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not, not really. Well, I got that curry down there. Oh, okay. Then I'll be good. Yeah. All right, so, uh, yeah, it's Tuesday. Though, which means tomorrow is the main show. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be doing the Grinder Killer and uh, some other online murderers. Um, ch- going to keep it to like maybe three or four, so it's the show's not like super long. But somebody requested that we do the Grinder Killer, so so I'm going to do that and maybe like throw in a couple other internet based uh, serial killers as well. So that should be fun slash horrifying. Uh, so yeah. Be sure to drop by tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. And thanks for dropping by today. We will see you again tomorrow. Bye.